to be calling your Congress people constantly, daily, drive by their offices and blow your horns, do anything to get their attention, and even if they're not there, when you drive by their local offices because they're in D.C., there's staff there, they'll know, and if you camp out in front of their offices and you make sure that what you want and what's important gets heard, at least by their staff, if nobody else, it'll get communicated to them. And at some point in time, there's enough of that kind of pressure that goes on. These people may be paid off by buckets and wheelbarrows full of cash being wheeled into their offices on, you know, on Capitol Hill. But you know what? They've got to come home sooner or later. Just keep up the pressure. This is not a time to back off. This is not a time to rest on your laurels. And keep preparing. Keep bringing in foods and water filters and a means to defend yourself. And I know we keep falling back into that conversation. And I know I keep hearing it from people, ah, oh, come on, it can't be that bad. Um, yes, it can. And you certainly do not want to find out that it can be that bad without having had some time to prepare. Or you're done for. It's as simple as that. Bob, anything well, I get a lot of... What's that? I said, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I get a lot of uh, letters from people in the military and, uh, you know, from all stations uh, within that structure. And they're all veterans. Uh, they've all been overseas and, uh, and uh, been involved in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. And they all say the same thing. They better not push me. They better not bring in foreign troops. Because we're going to do away with them. And if the government tells us to go out and collect American people or shoot them, it's over for the government. And that's why, and that's why the government plans on bringing in foreign troops to American soil and then giving the GPS coordinates that your lovely census workers have come and shot off your front door. But I, Bob, I, I've been saying all along that it will be an economic decline in this country with an associated collapse of the dollar worldwide that would bring us to this kind of a, uh, a situation. My sense has been that at the point in time when we descend into that collapse here in the U.S., the attendant dollar decline is going to cause a lot of civil unrest all around the world. Now, when it comes time to sending foreign troops into this country, when Obama makes that call, I think what the other people in other countries are going to say is, look, sir, you created this mess in your country, and now we're dealing with our own civil unrest. Solve your own problems. Troops, we can't send them to you. We're busy quelling our own riots in the street. You think that's, and that's uh, true. You think, you think uh, that that's the way it might go? Absolutely. Fifty percent of the world governments will be in revolution. Maybe more. I always tend to be conservative. But that's what we're looking at. And if they think, you know, like, do, do the Russians really want to send troops here? You've got to be kidding me. Didn't and you have talk of it? Yeah, didn't you have somebody who sent you a uh, letter about a uh, woman whose husband was in the Russian military asking about what it would be like if he had to come to America? No, I don't think I had uh, one like that. Uh, perhaps it was another, but... I have, to, uh, I have to send you that because that made the rounds. And what happened was that this Russian military person was told that the worst thing he could imagine was being sent into a country where there's something like 400 million weapons and a whole, you know, 80 million at least who know how to use them. What a nightmare scenario that would be. You think... Uh, the, numbers, the numbers are even worse than that. Yeah. I mean, there's 450 million at last count. There's 80 million veterans, 40 million combat veterans, and then all the people who have been shooting for years. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. You're talking 200 million people. Does some army really want to tangle with that? Tangle with that? 
No, you know. I mean, even with a 20 or 30 to 1 kill ratio, you're still a loser. Well, you know, it's interesting. I hear these stories about 100,000 troops being sent to NORTHCOM to prepare for civil unrest in this country. And I think to myself, 100,000 barely makes up the population of a small town, let alone these big cities. And, Christ, the criminals have more guns than the 100,000 troops going into, say, Phoenix or, uh, you know, any of the larger cities. They're going to have a field day out there. I mean, I hate to well, think about it. As an example, Los Angeles has 250,000 gang members, and this is the L.A. Um, Long Beach area, who are better armed than the military. And they, they will take them on, they take on anybody. I mean, these people get screws loose. And if uh, a foreign force came in, you know, kiss it goodbye. What an absolute mess. And of course, you know, the, the thing that's interesting is that, you know, while you're in the middle of fighting that battle, in the meantime, probably the best thing that you and I as individuals can do is kind of lay low and let that stuff go so that we're around in the after battle because that's where it's going to make a difference. Don't get out there and go trying and trying to attack them because you'll uh, you'll lose in the process. The trick is to keep your powder dry and save yourself for when it really matters. Bob, I uh, actually have a question in the uh, in the chat room that's somewhat related to that. Robin uh, writes the question. Hang on just a second here, and let me see if I can find it. I thought I had it up on the screen here, and it sort of went away from me. Um, but anyway, she asked the question that if the barbaric illuminists uh, did in fact bring us into a uh, deflationary depression, what would happen to uh, gold and silver? And what would happen also in terms of uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, living conditions? Well, first of all, if you have inflation, gold goes up and silver with it. If you have deflation, gold sometimes goes up and holds its own. So gold, from an investment viewpoint, is a two-edged sword. You win on both sides. And if we are going to have trouble economically and financially, then what you want to be is in gold and silver with that extra money that you have after you've got the basics to do what you have to do for your family. And so the answer is very simple. When we have inflation, gold and silver go up. When we have deflation and we have a flight to quality, then gold and silver hold their own, make them off some of the somewhat, but when everybody else is losing 60 to 90 percent of what they've got, you're going to be able to maintain your buying power. My, you know, my understanding of that is that in the deflation, what's attendant and associated with that is a collapse of manufacturing, a collapse of business, and a collapse of productivity. Silver, because it is in part an industrial metal, loses on that score and therefore would lag gold in that type of a situation, but would come into play later on as, as you said, the flight to quality occurs, and frankly, it would probably take on a bit more of a uh, bartering and trading type of uh, commodity status as opposed to uh, gold just simply because of its value per ounce. A little hard to uh, take an ounce of, uh, you know, or even a fractional coin of uh, gold worth $250, let's say, in today's value uh, to the store for a loaf of bread. Um, but in a deflationary environment, the issue might be more whether or not you could get that bread at all because would there be anybody still making it? Well, that's a good point. And, uh, but there will still be people doing what they do. And uh, you need a, a cost of... Um, uh, of uh, uh, tradable yeah. items, and, and, and silver is important in that perspective. I've always looked at silver uh, as a 30% participant in gold, 70, and in each, each interest, the best thing to own 
uh, in that environment is uh, silver uh, coins that were minted prior to 1964, which would be junk silver, it's, as it's called. It's 90% silver. Because everybody knows what a dime quarter and a half is. And with the uh, gold, uh, fractional coins are good. They run 0 0.19, 0 0.22, 0 0.24. And so around a fifth or a quarter of an ounce, and then you have your one ounce as well. And and so that's what you need to be able to trade. Maybe, uh, you know, 25 cents will buy you a basket of beans, green beans. And you can't use them all, so you go off and uh, you trade part of them for shaving cream and razor blades and...